Hello and welcome to another insightful episode of Curry Connect where I got to connect with Cyril Wong. Cyril is an award-winning poet, writer and novelist from Singapore who's been writing books like Satori Blues, 10 Things My Father Never Taught Me. Let me tell you something about that night which also by the way made it to the top 5 Straits Times bestsellers. This interview is all about love, human relationships, writing, poetry and how Cyril weaves these into brilliant and honest narratives through his works. Check out the interview, it's honest, fun and extremely engaging. I hope you like it. See ya. How did you start Cyril? How did you start writing? Uh, wow, that's a hard one. Uh, actually, I don't know how I started because it's like I went to, I mean, I, I, it's one of those weird questions because it's like trying to ask the origin of like an artistic life. And for me, I started out as a musician first. So I was doing a lot of classical singing. I was interested in Baroque music. I was part of a troupe that was, and, and, a, and a choral ensemble that was traveling a lot. So I thought, you know, for a while in my, you know, when I'm 16 or 17 or even earlier, I mean, I started really young, uh, but I started traveling at 16. And that whole period all the way into my, even my 20s, I think, I had this idea in my head that, oh, this is what my life will be from now on. And I, I'm really loving it because this whole process of disappearing into like performance and being in, the, in a group of people that you can travel and, and just perform in different places and you know all over the world it was kind of nice I thought I could just do that and just lead that kind of like anonymous artistic life it's like being a uh, uh, very pretentious basker basically you know <laughs> I think there was one occasion like maybe in Spain or, some, or Australia that I was actually singing on the street and I didn't mind, you know, with my friends. And I thought that was the life. And then I don't know what happened. Maybe I, I don't know, I hate to use the word, I grow up, but maybe I grew up and or people change or like my queerness fully kicked in, whatever that means. And uh, I started not really liking the people that I was hanging out with. I started realizing that I was more of a loner and stuff like that. And then school happened and I, I wrote my first kind of like a poem in class. It was a very depressing uh, piece of writing. And then my, I, re I remember very clearly my teacher asking me to see him after class and then asking me like, uh, uh, are you okay? Do you need help? <laughs> like, why? What's wrong? Maybe I, I was just playing with uh, couplets and line breaks. There's nothing psychologically wrong with me, you know. Uh, so I had no idea what writing was, what literature was. And, but I think that was the first time I decided to find out because it's like, since I'm going to be doing this, even if for fun, mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, just read up. And this is before the internet, as we all know. And then I was going to the library and finding out like, okay, who writes this kind of poems? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, 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 the names that are so cliched now were not cliched to me uh, then. So it's like, you know, Emily Dickinson, uh, Silver Plath, a lot of Anne Sexton. I think I really fell very, very deeply in love with Anne Sexton for a very long time. I just wanted to be, to, to write and sound like her. Uh, so that was a real uh, motivator. Then I went to national service, I think in a big way. And that was one of the most painful parts for any queer male person's uh, <laughs> personal history. And I ended up writing a lot of poems in those two and a half years while in my army uniform. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that was when I started to realize that. I, I didn't realize it. Uh, another friend was the one that looked over my shoulder and said, so you're writing poetry now? I said, yeah, but it's not serious. It's just, I'm, I'm just writing a diary, you know? Uh, it's, but then... I started to like contemplate like going for readings and talking to other poets and realize, hey, maybe I, I can do this. And then things started to escalate out of control. Uh, before I knew it, I was suddenly more of a writer than a musician. Uh, so I, I, I kind of I backed out of like a lot of, uh, a, a lot of that kind of like classical performance uh, background and I started to like 
uh, become more of a recluse, a kind of literary recluse. I had to started to write a lot, and school really helped. I, I realized that uh, it was an opportunity for me to really focus on like, okay, since I'm going to be doing this writing thing, let's study what writing is. Let's study the components of writing. Uh, what makes for good or bad writing, and and all that. And I started attending. I started, I started really loving the courses I was doing because everything fed in a very selfish way into my writing of poetry. You know, I realized that even though I wanted to stick to being a very confessional lyric kind of queer voice, but I could also uh, bring in a lot of things that I was reading about, um, you know, postmodernism, a critical theory about language and stuff like that. As a writer, you often end up sharing a lot of personal stuff, like you mentioned when you started out writing, you know, it came from a space which was very personal to you. Do you ever feel a sense of nervousness when that happens? But how, what, how is it going to be received or what, what's going on there? Um, well, yeah, I, I you know, I, I, it's, it's a weird situation to be in where I, I do get asked this question a lot in different times of my life and I always find it hard to answer it because there is so much to reflect on before I answer the question. Uh, my simple answer used to be, I think it, it, it still applies, which is that I was always very uncomfortable about being closeted, about being hidden, about being uh, unable to talk about who I am or having to pretend to other people that, you know, I'm straight or you know, stuff like that. So I always had this anger or this kind of like moral imperative to always speak my truth in very banal settings, like you, in, in the family gatherings or in groups of friends or in, in, in a artistic rehearsal, you know, it's like, I, I'm not going to lie about who I am. I'm going to be say certain things. I'm going to behave in a certain way that will be uncomfortable to either to you or to, or to your friends or to your relatives. Uh, and that applied to my writing as well, because I, I, it was a very natural thing for me to like, when I write, I'm not, I mean, certainly, definitely in the case of writing, it's the one place where I can really, really, truly not, not care. And then slowly I learned the division between uh, writing for myself and publishing, right? Uh, it was the, the publishing part that really made me think once, twice, three times before putting out a new new work because there were, you know, I found, I found myself being, I, I hate to use the word violated, but it felt very like a violation or a betrayal when, for example, your own publisher would turn to you and say that, or maybe you shouldn't be too uh, revealing about this. I mean, like, what? At two Brutus? Seriously? It's like, you? It's like, um, but you said yes, my manuscript. I thought you trusted that this is what, who I am. Like, why, why, why am I suddenly being banned from, from, from saying what is on my mind? So, I mean, th there was a lot of negotiations and stuff like that. I, re I realized I was dealing with a lot of other people's expectations of what... Uh, a published work in Singapore should be and what kind of poet that I should be in the context of Singapore. So that was, that became very political very fast. And I never knew because I, I came from a very cushy kind of a music background where you, you're just part of the group. You're just performing for an audience and no one knows your name. But when you become a poet, your name is attached to everything. Uh, there is no death of the author here, right? There is, uh, everything is about you. So I found, I found myself expending a lot of energy defending the fact that this is my voice. It is not an entirely, it's not an original voice. There have been queer writers and, you know, who, it's not even about the queer part you, I realized in Singapore. Being personal in Singapore is always very, very taboo. Especially, I think, in the 90s when I started writing because a lot of publishers were telling me that I couldn't present this kind of work because I was airing dirty laundry in, pub in public, mm. you know? And I'm like, seriously? Have you all not read Plus? Yeah. It's like, uh, why are we talking about here that poetry in Singapore should be about politics, should be about social things? Yeah. I have nothing against that. I read that too, but what, what, have, what's hap what, have, what is happening to diversity, you know? I wanted, you know, to contribute to the scene in a very, to make it more diverse. I wanted to have my own voice in there. And I so quickly found out that there was practically no one like me in, in the poetry scene. 
that was my first wake up call to become a, a you know more of a political figure or an account kind of activist in terms of you know in this paradoxical world of poetry right it's like I thought I was just going to be a poet and write poems and just publish them and disappear. You know, I became that kind of person that I never thought I would be. I thought I was just being a poet, talking about my poetry. But it's not just that. You're also someone that's speaking about your right to be heard as a queer person. Yeah. So that anger is, is what, I guess, made me shameless. Made me uh, less afraid of being embarrassed about writing about very personal things because it's like, you know, someone's got to do it. And if, since I'm so angry, I'm going to write on this way of, of anger and just do it. You as a writer have, you know, is going through that writing process and you are in your own world when you're, you know, writing so deep and then reading and referencing. How do you deal with breaking the, that zone of yours and entering into your daily life? That's what I Oh, uh, I think this is, a, my answer will will probably be very not unique i mean maybe maybe unique to me in the sense that because i'm such a confessional person and i'm a very uh truth speaking person so i don't really see a kind of divide between what is you know real life writing life and you know it's, it's all the same to me it is all an excavation all the time even you know i i remember in my 20s, everyone, including my uh, the people I was dating, always said I was too intense because I always want to talk about what is true. I mean, it's, it comes from a whole childhood of being pent up and being told that I cannot say certain things, right? When, when I finally had the opportunity to say, to say it, I just can't shut up. So uh, the reality of writing for me, it's, it's you know, I, I can never really... Uh, stop speaking the truth about it and so i never really saw a kind of divide and also uh for me how, how do i put it like the re you know the act of writing confessional verse the, of lyrical poetry has always been a reflection of the way i try to make sense of the world anyway so whether it's fiction or or or, or autobiography and stuff like that I, I really don't see a separation because it is all a kind of exploration it's all a kind of a, an, an in-betweenness so even when I'm say I'm writing a poem about like say um, being hurt by my parents right even then I'm negotiating uh, negotiating like uh, what aspect of this memory that I, I, I am talking about is true so the writing process of it is in itself a coming to a new place of like truth telling or finding a new perspective on what is an old memory. And mm -hmm. for me, you know, writing has always been an act of or process of rejuvenation or reinvention because I don't believe that the memories that I have, that I draw from in my writing yeah. is fixed. It is not a fixed or absolute mm -hmm. thing. So writing when it teaches me something new about that experience or of about memory, I feel like I've succeeded in something, especially when it comes to like very traumatic memories. For me, it's a very personal victory because I suddenly have power over this memory. It's no longer just a painful memory. For me, I, when I write about, about it, it's like, hmm, technically what, a, what aspect of this memory was traumatic to you. And then I can unpack it in literary ways, you know what I mean? And that, that's, for me, it's, it's so, it's, it's mind-boggling uh, and, and so aesthetic for me when I am able to like, unpack that in a poem and come to a new revelation about the past. And then that, for me, is a complete poem, you know? So the past, for me, is always being rewritten re so there is no absolute truth here. So this, 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 this whole divide between reality and fiction it's a negotiation that I thrive in, especially in the writing of, you know, confessional verse. What are your uh, three favorite recommendations that you would... I know it's a very vast question, but what are your three top three reads? Maybe what you're currently reading or what you prefer reading. Actually, like uh, Linda Peston's uh, new and selected... I think new and selected poems. Uh, Linda Peston's uh, book called... Uh, Carnival Evening, which is a collection of new and selected poems. And 
uh, it's the book that basically inspired me to write in the first place. So I have a very nostalgic uh, uh, love for that particular publication. Another book, it's actually a more recent one, uh, which is uh, Milan Kundera's uh, The Festival of Insignificance. Mm. It's a very slim little volume. And I always, I think I love that book, not so much for that book, but because I love Kundera, I, I think all my life, it was one of those authors that really shaped the way I thought about prose, especially how fiction doesn't just have to be about storytelling. Fiction can be about theory. Fiction can be also about whimsy mm -hmm. and surrealism. And you can break the form of the novel. And so this book came at a time where I was also thinking about meditation. I, think, I was thinking about emptiness uh, uh, and, and all that. And, you know, the, the Festival of Insignificance was one of those books that, that was so brief and short and so un kundera ish that, you know, it felt like a sustained prose poem more than a book. So it's one of those books that really I, I treasure for a long time. And I secretly hope it's not the last book he ever writes because it feels like an old man writing a, you know, a very small book because he's afraid that he can't finish it, you know, <laughs> if he writes for too long. Yeah. Another book is actually not, it's not literary, literary at all, which is uh, uh, a conversation between... Uh, Jiddu uh, Krishnamurti and uh, the quantum physicist uh, David Bohm. It's mm -hmm. called The Ending of Time. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite books because when I first read it, I didn't understand a single word that was being said in that, com in that public conversation that was being transcribed. I was like, who is this person? Who is this person? And why are they talking like this? And what's the context? It's so weird. And the whole journey of unpacking that context for each of the different speakers, one is a scientist, one is a, I don't know, a spiritual philosopher or however you want to term it. And then learning about the two of them and then separately, then coming back to the conversation. So I read the book like about 20 times. Each time I, I bring something new to it, either some new knowledge about the different authors or the different personalities or new life experiences. So every time I read it, and it's, it's, it's a conversation about what does it mean for time to end in relation to selfhood, in the relation to thought and memory. These are all big things, but it was such an everyday conversation that just unraveled. So the first, like maybe five, six times, I was like, I have no idea what you're saying. I just don't understand this at all. Then when I hit, I remember when I hit like maybe th uh, 32 or 33 years old, I was like, holy shit, I think I understood the first chapter. And I, I really started to understand everything. It's just, it just came to me. And the process of, of uh, reading it is, you know, it's the, it's, it's the thing I love about reading poetry. It's the thing about read, I love about reading like, uh, any text by Jiddu Krishnamurti, which is that the process of reading actually doesn't just give you new information. It doesn't just move you. It actually transforms the nature of your mind in a way that you don't control and it's i don't know it's, it's like some other unknowable force that just comes in in through the text and just like shakes things up inside the living room of your brain and you know christian christian Bhutti has this this effect so when i was reading it i was like why is my my brain i could feel my brain changing in the midst of this of reading this conversation and i i relate this to all forms of reading that excites me, whether I'm reading a simple haiku from someone else or I'm reading a philosophical text, if the text doesn't just give me new information, it doesn't just move me, it, it changes the way I see the world, it changes the way I see myself. And it makes me, I guess, to use a very negative word in a sense, it makes me disappear mm. for a while, you know, it makes me become more than just me, yeah. Sir Wong, you know. You know, with my limited memories and my faults and my paltry dreams, it's like, okay, I want to stay in this state. And Judah Krishnamurti is one of those writers that really makes me linger in this state for a long time, long after I put the book down. So the ending of time is one of those books I just go back to. It's like a, it's like a drug addict taking a drug again. It's, it's a major hit, you know. It just, I just get very high for, for like all of like five days after that. What do you think makes a good writer? You know, one, one of the things I learned from uh, studying 
studying uh, literary theory all these years is that there is really no absolute idea of what is good and bad. <laughs> and I, I think that's the thing I'm most grateful for all the way to my you know, doctoral degree once it was over. It's like, okay, that's something I really understood very, very, very uh, firmly, which is that it is all subjective what is good and bad and sometimes very much determined by time and place and very banal circumstances, you know. Uh, for me, you know, for example, what is good is what, you know, I think that the three things I was talking about earlier, is that the three things that move me in a piece, which is that it gives me new information. Uh, second thing would be it, it moves me in, in a very human level. It's like, it makes me like, Oh, it just takes my breath, like, you know, it uh, makes me like weep a little inside. Uh, and the third part would be like, if somehow the, the, I'm able to enter the writer's like state of mind, uh, uh, transcend myself through the writing. That's something that I, I find, which is less tangible and harder to talk about. It's hard, it's hard to pin that down in an essay about why that makes a poem or a short story good. But, you know, it is that quality of, you know, maybe it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a sense of negative capability that it invokes in me when I'm reading the writing. If that happens, that for me, it's a good piece of writing. And for me, goodness or uh, literary uh, merit has nothing to do with, uh, I guess, trends it's nothing to do with uh what is popular right now or, and, and things like that it's very personal to me so I, I i do understand that you know a lot for example a lot of things that i find really really good there are plenty of camps out there that think that it's all shit so you know and i think that's perfectly okay and i wish people would just come to terms with it that it is okay to have different opinions about even say something like your favorite song or your favorite poem, stuff like that. But it doesn't seem to be that way, you know. Real life politics tends to like bleed all the way into like artistic politics, which is, is absurd to me. We can all have different kinds of like, you know, theories about art, you know, different tastes in music or painting. Why must my taste be lesser than yours, you know? That, so that speaks to a kind of human uh, fallibility that somehow we are not aware of in general. For aspiring writers, what do you think is uh, how do they work? Like, what makes, what should a writer keep in mind when they are writing? Maybe. Uh, it's something that I, I remind myself of too that as writers, as individuals, we all come from a very certain time and place. We are writing from a set of circumstances that are changing as we speak. And whether we like it or not, we are addressing those circumstances or we are drawing from them. So there is no real such thing as like art for art's sake. I mean, it's a nice idea, but even that is like, mm, it comes from somewhere, you know, it's like, it comes from perhaps some psychological impetus that you know, is defined by, you know, who your parents are, what kind of class you're born into, what race you are, whether you're a minority or not. All of these things should be made aware of when, when writing. Uh, and also, I think the, the very, very more banal uh, uh, thing to, to think about uh, or to do when being a writer or being a, a competent writer in any sense, would be to, for example, especially for poets, I find this to be a very good advice for poets in general, because poets tend to not do this. Uh, prose writers do this a lot. Poets need to read more of other poets that write about the same things that they write. <laughs> I find that prose writers do that very easily. It's, it's like, you know, they know what they're, they're up against. They, they know what they're competing with. But poets tend to, especially when they're younger, they always think that, what I'm doing is special. <laughs> no one speaks like me. My life experiences are my own. Yes, but how you write about it is, you know, might not be as, you know, unique as you think. And so it's very important to read other poets like you, especially other poets like you who are writing in kind of similar circumstances as you. And that's very intriguing because you can start a kind of like meta form of like dialogue with these other poets as well, you know. 
yeah, I mean, this all of these things enriches the poem, enriches the writing, and you know, more poets need to do it. You were supposed to write a novel where you know about Singapore, where you have a tourist and the tourist is going around. So what are the top three places? Now this could include your food factor. <laughs> what are the three places that you would recommend or you would put that tourist in, you know, at multiple points in the narrative? Places in Singapore, that's a hard one, God. I mean, it's like, uh, because, you know, I, I used to say a lot more names of places be, uh, in the past because I have so many fond memories of it, but you know, I'm sure you know this as well. Singapore is always changing. Yes. The places that you loved, you know, it's like, oh my God, what happened to this place? It's now a mall. So why do you renovate this mall? It's like, or, or this shopping center, you know, things like that. It's like, it's, it's just very confusing. Uh, I think the one place that I always, you know, I, I lived there for, for three years in this kind of like artist commune. It was cheap rent and everything. But I live in Little India. And Little India was like my one of my favorite places to be in, it's probably is my favorite place to be in Singapore where it's like, it's, it, it never sleeps. Yeah. I can buy anything. I want to buy meat, I can buy meat. I want to buy jewelry, I can buy jewelry at 3 a.m. in Mustafa. Uh, and then have, have, a, have, a, have, a, have a tea with some friends all the way until like 5 a.m. and then go back to sleep and, you know. So Little India was the, the place to be and it was, it has been relatively untouched by any form of uh, urban development or gentrification. Uh, yeah, so it's if you want to see a, a place in Singapore that is relatively, you know, timeless, I would say Little India. It's a mix of many things. Uh, other places would be like, oh gosh, I, I really cannot think of anything. Uh, for personal reasons, uh, reasons, I would say the Parkway Centre, uh, Marine Parade Hawker Centre, because the food, everything about the food in there, from the nasi padang to the <laughs> to the noodles and everything. So that's like my it was my my child my childhood uh, growing up uh, a storehouse of food memories. Uh, I can't think of the third place. The third place is very lame, which is just the East Coast Beach. It's just to you know, it's the place where I remember that Singapore is really is just an island. Sometimes in Singapore, I forget that, you know, we are really just a dot in, in the larger scheme of things. And being at East Coast Beach, uh, because I'm Easterner, right, whatever that means in, in the larger context of the world, but I, I lived in, like, on the eastern part of Singapore. I lived near the sea for a really long time. And it really shaped who I am. Living near, knowing that there's a body of water out there, right, just five minutes away from you, it defines who you are as a person. It, it really makes you take a lot of things less seriously. So in Singapore, where everything's all about like, you know, I don't know, politics, social media, being busy, materialism, uh, being caught up with the next thing, we forget that, you know, we have a beach right there that we can just go to and just hang out. Yeah, and just chill, you know, have, have meaningless barbecue with badly cooked meats on the grill and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that really define a lot of my, my childhood is 